All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up. It is Tuesday, it is noon, and it's time for the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Kent Brena, who is the Elliot S. Vassell Professor of Professor and Chair of Pharmacology at the Penn State College of Medicine. We look forward to talking to him today. Uh, interesting topic that has our Zoom room filling up. As usual, we want you to tell us who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. Drop that in the chat box. We will be opening it up for questions, have a number of questions that were already pre-submitted that we're gonna to get to. Uh, but we encourage you to drop your questions in the Q&A tab and uh, hopefully we can get to some of those additional questions today on the virtual speaker series. I see Hal Hoffman from Kissimmee, Florida and Vicki Gensel from Harrisburg and Marie Frakes. Good to see you all. Representatives from Texas and obviously here in Pennsylvania, I see Ernie Russum from Paoli and uh, I see Eric from Roanoke, Texas and Whitney Martin from the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia and Laura Braxton. It looks like she has intentionally spelled uh, that city and state wrong for, for very good reason. But Lauren, thank you for joining us from the backyard of the enemy. I see Zachary Gaskell from Delmont, Pennsylvania. Welcome in. Windsor, Virginia, represented by Phil Barnes and Melissa Moran is here from Monroe Township. Good to see the Zoom room filling up this morning. Janet from Gulf Mills and uh, let's see, Linda Redding from Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. Sam in Albuquerque, New Mexico, welcome in. Uh, we have uh, Penn Staters tuning in from all over the country. I'm waiting to see Mazatlan, Mexico dropped in there. We usually have a uh, somebody zooming, zooming in from there to make it an international crowd today, but Paul McConaughey tuning in from, from Cape Cod and Scott down in St. Petersburg, Florida. Those two would probably like to, well, at least Paul would probably like to switch, switch places with Scott. Uh, I know it's chilly here in the Northeast and uh, looking forward to some of the Nicer weather uh, that those of you down in St. Petersburg are enjoying. We'll get started in just a minute here. We have a great program lined up for you. Dr. Kent Brena is with us from Penn State's College of Medicine. See Dave Roth from North Carolina. Michelle Wright down in the DFW Metroplex. One of the last places we traveled to was DFW for the uh, Cotton Bowl, which Penn State was victorious over the Tigers of Memphis in the 2019 Cotton Bowl. Seems like many, many years ago, but uh, just a little bit over a year ago, we were down there with the Penn State football team. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good afternoon. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. <coughs> Excuse me. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. We're live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Kent Vrena, who is the Elliot at 
Elliot S. Vessel, Professor and Chair of Pharmacology at Penn State's College of Medicine. Pennsylvania leads the nation in supporting research on medical marijuana, and Dr. Vrena directs one of the eight state-approved academic clinical research centers. Today, he will demystify the pharmacology of marijuana and CBD oil. He will provide insights into the current uses of cannabis and its extracts and lead a discussion on the pros and cons of this alternative therapeutic approach. Dr. Kent Vrena received his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from our sister Big Ten institution at the University of Iowa and his PhD in Biochemistry from the Louisiana State University Medical Center in New Orleans. His postdoctoral fellowship training was in embryology and molecular biology at the Carnegie Institution of Washington in Baltimore. Uh, it's on the campus of Johns Hopkins University. Following faculty positions at West Virginia University Health Sciences Center and Wake Forest University School of Medicine, in 2004, Dr. Vrena assumed his leadership responsibility right here at Penn State. Please welcome Dr. Vrena to today's virtual speaker series. Kent, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. And I'm delighted, as always, to talk with other Penn Staters about what we're doing down here in the College of Medicine at, uh, in Hershey. What I'd like to do is share with you today uh, a couple of things. Introduce you first to the Penn State Medical Marijuana Academic Clinical Research Center that I direct. I'll tell you how that came to be and spend some time talking about the myriad different projects that we have going on trying to understand the benefits and the potential harms of medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, and this new landscape of unregulated CBD oil. And so let, without further ado, let me go ahead and share a screen. So as I say, and as Paul introduced, I'm the chair of pharmacology here at the College of Medicine. That's the department that not only teaches our young cl clinicians to be about drugs, but also investigates them. And for the last 18 months or so, I've directed our academic clinical research center. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, as as uh, Paul referred to, the fact that I am the chair of pharmacology, I need to disclose that I do direct a sponsored research agreement from our partner, Pennsylvania Options for Wellness, and Tom Trite, the president and CEO of that company that provides support for much of the work that we do. Let me just start off by giving you a sense for what my vision is. In what I would like to accomplish in the next 10 years and our research agreement is a 10 year agreement is to create a partnership with Pennsylvania Options for Wellness that will make Penn State University a worldwide leader in medical marijuana and medicinal cannabinoids. And we're well on our way to doing that here in about our 18th month as a center. We're gonna accomplish that by facilitating the research of others, by engaging other scientists here at the College of Medicine and at main campus and at branch campuses, as a matter of fact, in doing work on medical cannabis and cannabinoids. And those two things are not exactly the same thing. And I'll hope to give you a little bit of insight into that. And we're gonna accomplish this by creating this an ecosystem, a scientific ecosystem, if you will, that allows people to realize their full potential, take the tools that they have and apply them to better understanding medical marijuana. So what are, what are the options? What's going on nationwide when it comes to medical marijuana and cannabis? Well, the one option of course is to legalize everything, recreational, medical, whatever. And that is reflected by the Western tier, much of the Western tier states, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, New Mexico, we can legalize medical pot, which is the smoked marijuana, 
But we can also legalize medical extracts, which take the active ingredients out of the marijuana and then package it in other forms that can be taken orally or under the tongue or rubbed on the skin. And that's what happened in 2016 when Pennsylvania Act 16 was first approved and signed into law by the governor. The fourth opportunity is to decriminalize marijuana. Uh, recognizing that there is a great push across the nation to decrease the demonization of marijuana. As you all know, it's a Schedule I felony in the United States right now. And there are a lot of arguments and initiatives in place to try and decrease that criminalization. And then a fair number of states have no formal legalization, but have chosen not to prosecute the use of uh, non-psychoactive molecules or extracts like CBD oil that was recently um, approved by the 2018 Farm Bill, as I'll share with you in a few minutes. This is the landscape. Right now we have 36 states that have legalized recreational or medical marijuana in one of its forms. The blue states have legalized recreational. The dark green states have, rec uh, have uh, legalized uh, medical marijuana. And you'll note that Pennsylvania is one of those. And then a number of states in the light green or the gray have either decriminalized or have modified their laws somewhat. And I just learned that uh, Virginia just passed a law to legalize recreational, so they'll be added to the dark green list soon enough. So that's the landscape that we're looking at, keeping in mind that the federal government still classifies marijuana as a class one, schedule one drug. That is a drug with no medical benefits and uh, abuse potential. And as you're going to see in a minute, it's clear that marijuana and cannabis have been used for millennia to address medical problems. So it has medical potential. And in fact, we have two drugs that are derived from marijuana that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And I'll tell you about that in a moment as well. So we're faced with this problem that the states are legalizing it as a recreational drug, or they're legalizing it as a recreational drug and a medical drug, but the federal government still maintains it as a Schedule I felony. And so we've got to find our way through that. And Act 16 from 2016 uh, did that by setting forth a set of rules by which the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania can get access to the potential therapeutic benefits of cannabis and, cannab and cannabis extracts. And this is taken from that act, Act 16, Section 102. And basically, it suggests that there is evidence that medical marijuana has potential therapeutic effects. And if we're going to allow the people of the Commonwealth access, we need to regulate the program to enhance patient safety. And so it was therefore the intent of the assembly to give an access to marijuana initially marijuana extracts, and then to provide a safe and effective method for delivering, monitoring that distribution and what is being distributed. And then finally, this third clause, which is so important to our conversation today, is it wanted to provide a mechanism, a pathway by which we, we can promote high quality research to fill in some of those holes in our knowledge, those gaps that uh, prevent us from being able to fully realize the potential benefit of marijuana. There are currently 23 different approved medical indications here in the Commonwealth, and those are listed here. And as you can see, we started with the preliminary list in 2016, which is in black. Then in 2018, Secre uh, the Secretary of Health and Physician General Rachel Levine approved ad adding opioid addiction, muscle spasticity, neurodegeneration, and terminal illnesses to that. And then in 29, uh, 2019, added anxiety and Tourette's syndrome. Now here I'll point out that for probably two thirds of these, there is precious little information. 
that would suggest that medical marijuana is going to be effective for these problems. That's not to say that it might not be able to treat some of the symptoms, but for two thirds, there's no or very little data to suggest that it can treat the disorder, can, can treat the disease, not the side effects. So that's one of the things that we want to do in the ACRC here at, in Hershey is to explore a variety of these different mechanisms, as you'll see, trying to figure out what is the right dose, what is the right delivery method. In addition to changing the approved indications, the state also uh, changed two years ago the mechanism by which you could take it. And, and that big change was to approve the availability of combustible marijuana, that is the dry flower, such that it could be vaporized or um, consumed in a vaporization machine or even smoked although the state does not advocate for that, but it does make it a, uh, a possibility. And that complicates things a little bit, and we can talk about that during the Q&A. Well, I'm gonna get my geek on for you. I am a scientist after the fact, uh, as a matter of fact, and I wanna tell you a little bit about the pharmacology because after 25 years of studying drugs of abuse, the one thing I can convince you of, I hope, is that Drugs like marijuana and heroin and cocaine and alcohol, when taken into our bodies, all access a system that already exists in us, that we already use. And that is known as the, in this case, as the endocannabinoid system. We have mechanisms within our body to produce molecules that act like cannabinoids, what we now know are cannabinoids. And these are the various chemical structures of those. And the only thing I'll say about their structures is that they're derived from arachidonic acid, naturally occurring fat that's found in our body. It's an important component of um, making up our, our membranes. And uh, these are also precursors to things that are involved in inflammation and pain. And in fact, aspirin works by blocking the conversion of arachidonic acid to other bioactive ingredients that are associated with pain and fever. So we have this system. We use this system on a second to second basis in our brains and in our bodies to regulate things like inflammation and mood and our relationship with the environment. And so the difference is these are handled on demand, they're produced on demand, and they're produced in relatively small amounts. But what we can do is take marijuana, for instance, smoking it, take high concentrations into our body and overwhelm this system, the endocannabinoid system, with drug from the outside. And it produces the high that you're familiar with from marijuana that's caused by the active ingredient tetrahydrocannabinol. And here are, is that structure, THC is found on the left. This is Delta-9 THC. It's the component of cannabis that causes the high. Notice it doesn't look very much like the endocannabinoid system, except perhaps for this long tail here is also present here. And so this causes the high, but what's interesting is another component of marijuana or cannabis is cannabidiol or what you know as CBD. And so in 2018, when hemp was deregulated by the 2018 Farm Bill, that deregulated CBD. And as a result in the last two years, we've had an explosion of, cannab uh, of CBD oil that you can buy over the counter. The thing to remember is that CBD does not cause the high that THC does, but it does have bioactive characteristics. It's an anti-inflammatory, CBD is. So there are reasons to believe that CBD and THC have some medical, potential medical benefits. Just to demystify this or actually make it more complicated for you, the cannabis plant is part of this family of cannabacea. 
And there are various species and, and classes of the compound, but cannabis sativa sativa on the left here is what we know as traditional marijuana. The exact same plant, however, is industrial hemp. They are genetically the same species. The difference is just as we have different species or, or subspecies of corn or of petunias, these have been bred such that this cannabis, marijuana, contains high concentrations of THC and so is recreational. Whereas this compound or this version of cannabis does not contain THC. And in fact, in the United States, it's defined as a plant that is less than 0.3% THC. It has tremendous potential for making fibers that are turned into ropes and cloth, for instance, and the leaves produce CBD or cannabidiol that has potential for creating CBD oil that's used in a variety of different ways. I will point out, however, it's unregulated, and we know very little about the kinds of things that it can do. So here at the Academic Clinical Research Center, here at our Medical Marijuana Center, we're focused on the following premise. That is that the endocannabinoids, these blue dots here, access the exact same receptors that the phytocannabinoids access. These are the compounds that come from plant. This is Latin for plant. So we have the endogenous cannabinoids. We have the plant cannabinoids like hemp and uh, marijuana. And then we have a variety of chem synthetic chemical compounds that are used as experimental tools and even as medicines, as you'll see in a second. But our point is they all three of these access the same systems in our bodies. And I'm not going to go into any detail except to say that these systems that we have characterized over the last three decades, we know are engaged in things like pain and appetite and mood and inflammation and these other things. So it's clear that there are reasons to believe that marijuana has activity medical, potentially medical activity. But what we need to do is establish a mechanism by which that can be studied. And that's what our Medical Marijuana Center does. We were one of the first three to be approved. I will point out that we've had marijuana dispensaries for about four years now, um, but the state was slow in approving the what are called clinical registrants that partner with the academic clinical research centers. And so we were one of the first three that was approved and I direct that center. And that center works in partnership with a company in Harrisburg that is directed by Tom Trite, a, a licensed pharmacist to uh, do high quality research. I think the Commonwealth leads the nation in promoting research into what works and what is potentially harmful with medical marijuana. This just gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we're doing down here in Hershey. My, each, each person in parenthesis in, this, in the next tables refer to a laboratory, an independent laboratory under the direction of their own professor. And so professors Lou and Yoon are in my department. And we, and, and along with my own group, are interested in the potential role of cannabinoids in cancer. Now, let's not lose sight of the fact that cannabis is uh, and should be an important adjuvant at, during end of life in terminal diseases. It has, has a way of relieving pain and reducing anxiety if used appropriately. But I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about treating the side effects of cancer, but can it actually play a role in cancer itself? And we're very actively engaged in understanding that for prostate cancer, for colon cancer and for neuroblastoma in particular uh, and melanoma for that matter. And so we're trying to identify what are the molecules, not just the mixture, but what are the molecules, the actual compounds that might inhibit the growth of cancer cells. And, and, and in addition to that, diving a little deeper and trying to figure out what is it that they're doing that does that? How, how is it that they're affecting this reduction in growth? Now, having said that, 
Uh, I speak a lot to the public and uh, I am frequently asked, well, should I be using this instead of these harmful cancer chemotherapeutic drugs? And my answer is no, you should not. This is an adjunct to that at this point. We have no evidence that cannabis and cannabinoids are gonna be any better than this. some of these fantastic drugs we've developed over the last 50 years for treating cancer. But we wanna also investigate the opportunity to enhancing the activity of those compounds. Another group uh, is very heavily engaged in understanding how it is that cannabinoids might modulate pain. Uh, Nick Gra Graziani in anesthesia and Fadia Kamal in uh, orthopedics are very interested in varying the ratio of THC to CBD to find that sweet spot. And I know we had a, a couple of questions about that. What's the right dose? What's the right ratio? And um, and so we're trying to understand that in animal models of pain right now with being so that we can provide guidance to the dispensaries on what the right thing to give is. And that's one of the sad commentaries about where we are nationally is that we don't have that kind of guidance. So right now, frequently somebody goes to a dispensary and they get whatever is available at that moment. Uh, because we don't know what's the right thing, the right dose, the right ratio, and the right mode of administration just yet. Although I'm very excited about the potential that we might be able to use topical applications so that you don't even have to take this stuff into your body, but use it to treat joint pain in osteoarthritis, for instance. And that's something that Fadia Kamal is working on. We also have the head of our pain clinic, Vitaly Gordon, is very interested in using this to supplement opiates at, after surgery so that less opiates are used that might be able to reduce how much opiates are required uh, to manage pain. And then Tim, Tim Daimling in OBGYN is doing a clinical trial right now in humans to examine the role of CBD oil in treating endometriosis pain. And then we're trying to better understand the cannabinoids and their receptors, those, those systems in the body that we're accessing with phytocannabinoids. And we've been very active in the last six months trying to understand drug-drug interactions where taking a cannabinoid can interfere with the drug that you're normally taking. And I'll spend just two slides on that in a minute. And then we're trying to establish a database that'll help us understand what drugs, what ratios work best for what indications. So you can see, going back to the mission statement that I started with, our job in the center is to leverage all of these bright minds to get them to focus some of their attention on using cannabis and cannabinoids to treat human disease. I do have concerns, however, about medical marijuana and CBD and I refer to it as the four U's. They are largely unregulated nationally. They definitely are unreliable, depending on the source. They're unproven by scientific evidence in many cases, and they have unintended consequences. And in another talk, and, and by the way, I'm open to come and talk to anybody or spend time with anybody that wants to learn more, I would go into each of these four in turn. But let me just point out Here's an example of what one of my colleagues, Wes Rop Konsavich did, is he bought two, three reliable CBD oils over the internet. And rely, by reliable, I mean they had uh, certificates of, of their composition, so we kind of knew what was in there. He had them independently tested, and yes, they had what they said they had. But you can see, they're totally different. They're all CBD oils, but... While they have about the same amount of CBD in them, they obviously have other things. And in this case, we know from the analysis that they have varying levels of chlorophyll that came from the plant. Uh, and we went on to show that, that uh, in terms of anti-cancer activity, and we published this in August, one of them had activity against cancer cells, but the other two pretty much did not. That's not to say there's anything wrong with them. It suggests strongly there's something else in there that's having an effect. And most importantly, something that we also published this last summer in July, 
um, was the report a report on the potential drug drug interactions. And so what we found was that through a virtual analysis of the activities of the cannabinoids, in particular THC and CBD, um, there's a really good chance that taking those without telling your doctor could interfere with the metabolism or the disposition of a drug that you're on for a disease. And so here's just a list of the compounds. And this is all available online, free access through Medical Cannabis and Cannabinoids, a journal in full disclosure that I'm uh, an associate editor of. And this is the list of various drugs. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into this at all, except to say that one of my favorite drugs to worry about is on this list, and that's warfarin, which is a, a anticoagulant or a blood thinner. And um, I think it's important that if you're on warfarin, you let your doctor know before you take something like CBD oil or medical marijuana, because it could be interfered with by those compounds. Your warfarin could be. So I'll just close by pointing out we've got a lot of reason to believe that marijuana and cannabis have potential benefit. We're going to be studying CBD oil and endometriosis pain, uh, trying to limit the amount of opioids that are required following surgery. What are those optimum ratios of THC and CBD? Understanding that THC has been approved by the federal government, pure THC, for treatment of nausea, vomiting, and appetite um, uh, stimulation, whereas CBD has been approved by itself to uh, prevent or to reduce uncontrolled seizures in kids. Those are There are two drugs, dronabinol is THC, and Epidiolex is CBD. So we know that they have potential, but what about in combination and what about the ratios that might be efficacious? Treating, using them to help with opioid addiction, uh, monitoring, we want, I'm very keen on uh, monitoring drug-drug interactions and, and the bad side of cannabinoids that might interfere with the drugs that you're on for other purposes. Uh, we want to start thinking about personalized medicine. We want to build a new program for training the next generation of can cannabis researchers. And then we're uh, in entering into conversations with a, a local undergraduate institution about potentially creating a certificate program or an undergraduate degree in cannabis and can cannabinoid research. So in summary, while there are many reasons to believe that cannabis and cannabinoids have benefits, uh, we need to figure that out. And that's where I think we lead the nation or will soon here in the Commonwealth and in particular at Penn State. I worry so much about CBD oil because you can buy it across the counter uh, at your local gas station, uh, at your GNC, but it's unregulated. So you don't know what you're getting. And more importantly, because it's natural, people think it's safe and we know that it can have side effects especially with interfering with your normal drugs. And then as the case with all dietary and herbal supplements, just disclose to your doc that you're, that you're either using a recreational cannabis or you're using CBD oil, or you through a different mechanism have accessed the medical marijuana program because your doctor needs to add that to your medical record to better understand what's on board in your body. So with that, I'll point out that it takes a, vision, a village. We're all Penn Staters. Uh, my own group here on the left, and then the, the groups of these various professors here on the right. Uh, and then as always, I have to thank Tom Trite and Pennsylvania Options for Wellness for their very generous support, as well as my endowment, the Elliot S. Vassell Professorship. So with that, I thank you for your attention and we can take questions now. Absolutely. And we have a, first of all, thank you for that presentation. Um, we have a good number of questions um, coming in, but let's start, let's start with, you know, where does, where does recreational use of, mar of marijuana enter into this conversation? In full disclosure, I've been studying substance abuse for 25 years and uh, it started out studying cocaine and alcohol more recently have been working on opiates i think we have to go very slowly with medic with recreational marijuana the uh, lieutenant governor mr fetterman really is promoting recreation um, it 
is a, will be a source of tax income, I, I agree. But marijuana is not without its potential harm. And we're seeing this in particular in Colorado where it's totally unregulated. And so what they've been doing is breeding higher and higher and higher THC content plants. And that is having a dramatic effect on increasing anxiety and causing problems. So I think we should go slowly. In adolescence, in children and adolescents in particular, it has a tremendous negative potential. We know that heavy use in adolescence leads to an increase in schizophrenia later in life. And so I think we just got to go forward slowly. And so um, I think it's on the way, probably. We see it in the states around us, but PA can be a leader in, in taking a measured approach. And, and what, what you talked about the increased levels um, of, uh, for lack of a better word, the active ingredient. And I know you're a doctor and not um, a legal scholar, uh, but is it, are there addictive qualities? Is it, um, is, is that remain a concern with marijuana? Especially, uh, Paul, as THC contents get higher and higher, there is a psycho psychiatric definition for cannabis use disorder. You can become physically and emotionally dependent on it. Um, and the higher and higher the concentration of THC, people pursuing a higher and a higher high, if you will, they're going to run into that problem. It is an addictive compound, not as addictive as opiates, for instance, but it um, is an impairing drug. We haven't figured out how do we handle impaired driving or operating machinery or in the workplace. It does alter our perception. So again, we've got to think carefully about this. So a number of questions that are coming in with real specific um, medical um, medical issues that people are wondering if marijuana um, has an impact on them. So let, let me go kind of one by one. Uh, first one, um, the status of mer medical marijuana for help with glaucoma. So um, glaucoma is an interesting story. As, as many of you know, glaucoma is a situation where there pressure builds up in the eye. It is clear that acute marijuana decreases that pressure, but we have much better drugs to do that that would not require that you smoke every two hours to keep the pressure down. We have to reduce that intraocular pressure and keep it down, not spiking it by having to smoke a joint every two or three hours. So um, it's clear that it reduces pressure, but it's not the drug of choice, going to be the drug of choice for reducing intraocular pressure. How about, um, how about chronic pain, like back pain and degenerative discs and arthritis? I think that's our, our greatest potential right now, and one that we're keenly interested in, in both human and animal models. It is clear that marijuana extracts, and this is interesting, marijuana extracts taken orally or under the tongue provide for a nice slow rise in the drug and then a slow decline. And that appears to have a great benefit for treating uh, neuralgias of many types, but in particular, we're looking at um, some chemotherapy-induced uh, model of sciatica, for instance. Um, so I think it's got a lot of potential. And I, what I think is most exciting is it should be able to be used with other drugs, because it, as long as there's no drug-drug interaction, to reduce how much opiate we would have to take, for instance. So a combination, you can imagine, of a marijuana extract plus a lower level of opiate might help with that pain. I think that's a tremendous potential there. How about um, more in the, the mental health range, uh, PTSD, uh, depression, um, areas of concern there? PTSD is on our list of indications from the state. I think we also have a great opportunity there. We're, we personally here at Penn State are a little behind the curve on that. Uh, the, the addiction center um, over in Philadelphia, one of the addiction centers has been studying that. I think PTSD is going to be a potential target for this. Uh, mental health disorders, I'm much less sanguine about. Uh, I was actually personally disappointed when we approved anxiety because high 
THC in a naive person causes anxiety. And so it can help some people, but it's going to exacerbate it for some people. And especially for naive individuals, I want to point out that there is a syndrome called CIAPP. And I have to think in my head, <laughs> cannabis-induced acute persistent psychoses. And there are a small number of people that the first time they use a high THC drug, first time they use THC, and it's a high THC a preparation. They get psychotic and it lasts long after the drug wears off. Uh, long lasting, I mean several days, including potential hospitalization. So luckily that's not a widespread problem, but anxiety is a tricky business, very nuanced. Low doses might help, high doses will make it worse. So we've got to try and figure out that sweet spot. Um, some, I, what I would consider to be uh, maybe technical questions around the THC and the CBD ratio um, for, for treatment. Uh, some other questions coming in around um, the regulations. Let, let's go with the ratio first. Yeah, we are, we are casting about in the dark here. Um, most dispensaries, I hope most dispensaries will get to the place where they have high THC with some CBD. And I didn't get into the pharmacology, but THC causes an effect, CBD blocks it. And so that perfect ratio is what we're looking for, that you have some, but you take the edge off. So I'm hoping that most dispensaries will have 10 to 1 THC CBD, 5 to 1, 1 to 1, and then 1 to 5, 1 to 10, you can imagine. I just can't provide any guidance yet in terms of what's optimal for a given disease. I will point out that in Europe, there is a compound a drug, I'm sorry, called Sativex, which is a one-to-one -one ratio. And that's being used for everything. And we're beginning to have trials of it here in the United States. I'm not, but uh, other companies, in particular the company that owns Sativex, GW Pharmaceuticals, is doing some trials to see what it works. And that's a spray that you spray in your mouth. It allows for a slow absorption through the membranes uh, under your tongue and your mouth. And um, that appears to be one of the best ways to start one to one. Do not go with all THC. That's the potential danger, I think. That's what people are pursuing to get high. Um, but have a little bit of CBD in there to counterbalance some of these other things that THC is doing. So you mentioned um, the ability to walk into any gas station or, or many gas stations, many locations uh, where we shop and find CBD products, find CBD oil. Is there any regulation of that in Pennsylvania? Is there a, a concentration level that says, you know, above this, it can't be sold over the counter or all I could only wish that there was some regulation on this. It's the wild west out there. The ag, the Department of Agriculture didn't know what they were doing when they deregulated hemp in 2018. It has now exploded. You don't know what's in there. You don't know how much is in there. That's what got us started on that study. There was a report that people were taking CBD oil and when it was analyzed, they found there was no CBD in it at all. Um, so you have no you have no way of knowing and we have no idea what would a bad concentration be. So it's unregulated except when harm is found. And so the FDA had to step uh, in twice in the last year. Once was when somebody had a high, and I forget it was either lead, some heavy metal was in their preparation, very dangerous. And the other was they, they stepped on two, 20 companies that were promising things from CBD oil that it is it cannot, they cannot produce. They were essentially lying to get people to take, to buy their product. So unregulated pretty much. And, and that's the scary part. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously new to this topic and, and new to kind of the area of pharmacology, but it strikes me as, as fascinating that that's something that is kind of naturally available um, has, has such a broad range of uses um, as, as a, as a drug therapy. Is that unusual in, um, in, in your, in your work that, uh, that something like this can help anywhere from depression to, to glaucoma and other medical conditions? 
That is, Paul, pretty unusual. Um, and I, we know why that is. There are two reasons. The first is that in the brain, the endocannabinoid system, the receptors, are the most prevalent in the brain. This includes targets of cocaine and heroin, um, antidepressants for that matter, the SSRIs. Um, the endocannabinoid system is throughout the brain and we now know that it tends to suppress activity. That's why it, CBD is probably good for seizures. It's suppressing this constant activity. So I'm not surprised that if you're doing something throughout the brain, it's gonna have an effect on many different things. Yeah. And the second thing is we've got this magic between THC and CBD. THC turns things on, CBD blocks that. And so the two working in combination is probably can be fine tuned to address a lot of different things. So it's one of the things that I find most exciting about getting into this field from studying cocaine and heroin and alcohol is the potential for good and bad. And we just have to be aware of that. Um, a couple more um, ailments people are asking questions about um, insomnia. And uh, well, first, let's start with insomnia. Does, does, does this help with that? This is that one's really complicated and I'd love to give you an answer and I don't but let me tell you an apocryphal story my wife has insomnia she can go to sleep like that but she wakes up in the middle of the night she can't go back to sleep and so a friend of ours from Carolina was saying oh you got to try this CBD oil thing and so she did and it did nothing so we got two problems here we don't have any science behind it and we do thank you for reminding me Paul we do have a sleep laboratory downstairs for right. me and uh, we could study that, actually. I need to go down there and talk to them. Thank you for that. I'll give you an acknowledgement if we ever publish anything. But the, the uh, um, so where was I going with that? Oh, so, so I think it's going to be an individual because insomnia can be caused by a lot of different things. And so for some people, it might work and some people it doesn't. So I think we just got to be careful. So one of the things I've noticed is that since CBD oil and medical marijuana have come into the marketplace, um, the, the, uh, the quote unquote industry has boomed, right? There, uh, it is a growing sector in terms, of, in, in terms of jobs. Do you find companies in this space are, um, are willing to fund some of the medical research um, so that you know, the products that they're putting out have research backing what they're doing? I think, I think they do. I think, for instance, in the case of uh, PA Options, our partner, they want us to find stuff and we wouldn't allow a company to control what we report. But, but Tom's, Tom Trite says, I want you to publish everything, good and bad, just so that we know. I think there are, there's an interest on the part of some companies and I'm not going to cast uh, right. stones at anybody, but there are some who just want to make the money. And so they don't want us finding that something doesn't work because that would cut into their bottom line. I think this is where we need regulations that heretofore the federal government's been silent on. Um, Bob's asking a technical question about the type of THC. Are you talking about um, decarby, I think it's is it decarboxylated form? carboxylated. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, I don't want to get too much down into the weeds, but you're spot on. The plant makes a carboxylated form that becomes decarboxylated to the active ingredient when it's smoked. Or in our case, when we extract the plant and we use a, a special process that heats it a little bit so that we're getting mostly decarboxylated. Um, and uh, we want to get straight to the active ingredient. And so that's a great question, Bob. Dennis is asking a question. Uh, you showed a chart with Sativa and, and, and Disha on it. Um, what, can you compare and contrast the difference between those two? So uh, Sativa Sativa and Sativa Indica are two, let's see, I guess they would be two families. They're, not, they're different species, they're families. Right. Um, and indica is touted as being higher THC content. And this is, a, this is quite a bit of chatter about this in the recreational community. Uh, we haven't studied indica at all, um, but it is, um, it is gonna be a source of 
compounds. And what we need to remember is that we're not just talking about THC and CBD, but there are a hundred different cannabinoids on top of those. Uh, we're hot on one called CBG right now, cannabigerol. But um, so there are these many cannabinoids and there are many compounds that are called um, uh, uh, terpenoids that are fatty acids that are like camphor that when you rub them on your skin, you can feel them. That's kind of a cooling sensation. So it's that whole mish, gamish that's going to give us, give us some uh, outcome ultimately. And so that's why ultimately we're looking at uh, marijuana and hemp now will probably move into indica in a, in a couple of years. Um, but I, I don't want to leave anything on the table. Um. So Shelly has an interesting question. How do you source? Uh, how do you source or obtain the products that you're conducting research on? Is it grown at Penn State? Do you do you source it from from other places? Shelly, that's a that's a great point, and you cannot believe the meetings I had with lawyers over this. We decided that we are not going to grow marijuana. We are not going to dispense marijuana or cannabinoids. So we don't grow it. But luckily for us, the federal government provides one farm that can provide us with marijuana, and that farm is the University of Mississippi. And so we get our marijuana from Mississippi, and we can extract it. We get our pure compounds, THC, from the federal government, from the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. But we're being so strict and so conservative because it remains a Schedule I drug that we're not even allowed to take it from our partner to study. And so what we've created are parallel labs where we make stuff the same way they make it. And then uh, we test it in our laboratories uh, and then provide the information to them to guide them. Uh, it's, it's a complex issue. So a question coming in, and I think this is more around the legalization argument for recreational use, but a question coming in, how do you draw the distinction between concerns over people misusing marijuana as a recreational drug and people overindulging in things like say fast food, right? Or unhealthy food or other legal activities like, like alcohol uh, that don't have an, any other inherent positives that, that marijuana seems to have uh, evidence of? You know, this is an argument that, that not even an argument, it's a discussion we need to have. So full disclosure, my drug of choice is a good single barrel bourbon. Um, <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really digging on Angel's Envy right now. And it is clear to me that alcohol is potentially more dangerous than cannabinoids, cannabis, marijuana, in full grown adults. So my concern is that supposedly 21 is when you start drinking, but we have tons of youngsters doing it. And we could lose an entire generation if, if, we, get, if we give them the impression that it's okay to use pot. And, and in fact, the evidence suggests it might even be dangerous up to the age of about 25 when our frontal cortex finishes rewiring. It is true that, that um, young adults sometimes have lapses in judgment because we're still wiring. So what do I say? It's safe for a full grown adult used in moderation, well, so is alcohol. But is that as an excuse? Is legalization of recreational marijuana, is that excuse that it is safer than alcohol. Is that the reason to add another mind altering drug to the list? And I'm just not convinced. So um, probably more questions coming in than we're gonna have a chance to get to here, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna just knock some of these off the list here because I think there's some really good questions coming in. Um, you talked about the interaction specifically with warfarin. Whitney's got a question about is, is, it, is it warfarin in particular or is it blood thinners and even natural blood thinners like fish oil um, or turmeric that people should be concerned about? I'm not aware of any interactions between turmeric and uh, fish oils. Warfarin is a big offender. We're studying right now what are called the DOACs. The, you've seen them, a Pixaban, what's it called? Eliquis uh, is marketed on TV. Um, we think they're going to be involved, but, but Warfarin is the big offender. I've got two loved ones, parents on 
on warfarin and um, as you know, anyone who's taking warfarin, you have to have your blood checked every couple of weeks to make sure that your international normalized ratio, your INR is where it should be. This will interfere with that. And we are now documenting that. We're preparing a paper right now that shows all of the accidents that have happened with that. Warfarin's a big offender. Other blood thinners are gonna be problematic. We just don't know how much yet, but I wouldn't worry about fish oil and turmeric at this point. So uh, some more questions coming in more maybe on the legal side of this. Um, Sharon uh, wanted you to know that she's a lawyer, thus the, the, the angle that she asked her question from. Um, but why so much fear about unregulation? The effort to decriminalize is all about um, it being a victimless crime. People should take personal responsibility for what they choose to put in, in their bodies. Is it more about that the deregulation um, could potentially put harmful amounts uh, in out there into the into the marketplace. That um, you know, I, I think of things that you could buy at the store, right? There, there's uh, you go into any CVS pharmacy, and there there's some regulation around even what you can buy over the counter. Is is that the angle that you're coming from? Is I want to be uh, I. I am open to the conversation and Sharon's point is right. This is about personal freedom in a, at a point. However, we have rules that say you cannot speed hundred miles an hour down 581. That's to protect other people. And you could say, well, you're not allowed to use this compound um, uh, while operating a vehicle. And we've got to figure that out. Here's where society hasn't caught up with, with um, the reality of the pharmacology. So your point is well taken. However, what concerns me is what we're seeing in Colorado right now. One recent report, there's an uptick in suicidality associated, not causal, associated with the increase in THC content and engendering such anxiety in some patients that it's possible that it's increasing suicidality. We are seeing huge increases in youngsters getting into the being brought into the ED because they got into mom and dad's gummy bears. Right. So I think if we move forward with recreational, I would hope we would do it in the following way that one, we regulate it so that we know what the concentration is and no, you don't need 30% THC marijuana. And then the second is that we have limited access so that you have to go to some place that can be trusted. Otherwise you're gonna get stuff with pesticides and heavy metals and, and they're gonna, and laced with the synthetic cannabinoids that we're studying that are so dangerous. So it needs to be regulated the trouble is if you look at a state, you're seeing one set of laws because nobody is the same. So Sharon's point's well taken, but we protect, uh, we protect our people from themselves all the time by setting guidelines and guide rails in the use of things. So we are coming up uh, on the end of our time. One final question that I'm gonna ask you is kind of, uh, I still think about this topic, right? And I still think that there is much stigma attached to cannabis, to marijuana, to CBD oil. What are the steps being taken to educate the public more? I know we're doing webinars like this. I know your research, but how are we getting that research out to normalize it um, to, to the general population to remove some of that stigma as, um, as something that's a true medical treatment? You know, I'm not going to demonize the use of marijuana. You're absolutely right. It is stigmatized. And and I would at some level like to say it's a personal choice. If someone wants to, to use recreational, that's their choice. It's so how do we get it out there? It's things like this. And as I said at the outset, I am open to coming to anybody's group and talking to anybody. I'm easy to find online, but even easier to email kvrana at psu.edu. And we are all Penn Staters. We know what that means. So, um, but I am doing a pretty poor job of getting it out there. I publish in the big journals, other geek scientists are reading my stuff and they're commenting on it. But the fact of the matter is that um, we don't reach out enough. And so this is what we're starting to plan now in year 18, uh, uh, month 18 of our center is how can the center be more outwardly focused? Because we are focused on the science right now, but we need to be better focused on uh, education. 
That's all the time we have for today. Dr. Vrana, thank you for joining us on the virtual speaker series. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to see me. Absolutely. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months, and this programming is in addition to a wide array of online networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can get the full listing at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you all for joining us today, and we are Penn State. Well done. Thank you.